Welcome to episode 202 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which you can find at 7-health.com forward slash 202. That's S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 202. Hi everyone. I'm your host, Lou Urich, and this is Real Health Radio. Real Health Radio is presented by 7Health. 7Health works with women who feel obsessed with and defined by their bodies. Using a non-diet, weight-neutral approach that combines science and compassion, we help you to transform your relationship with food, movement, your body, and yourself. We specialize in helping clients dismantle diet mentality and fat phobia, overcome disordered eating, regain their periods, balance their hormones, and recover from years of dieting, binging, exercise obsessing, and body hating by learning how to think critically about the messages they're consuming and the beliefs they're maintaining. And of course, learning how to connect with and listen to their bodies too. If you're looking for support in healing your relationship with food and your body, please don't hesitate to contact us. You can head over to 7-health.com forward slash help, and there you can read about how we work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. The address again is 7-health.com forward slash help. You'll also find it in the show notes. As you may know, if you're a regular listener of the show, 7-Health has been giving away a book from our resource list with every episode. It's our way of saying thank you to you, our Real Health Radio community, while also asking for your support and feedback through rating and reviewing the podcast. If you'd like a chance to win, all you need to do is leave a review on iTunes, take a screenshot of it, and email it to info at 7-health.com. Then you'll be permanently entered into the drawing. Weekly winners have the opportunity to select a book from our resource list, which includes some of our favorite publications on a variety of topics and can be found on our website at 7-health.com forward slash resources. For the book giveaway this week, the winner is Elinka C. Congratulations, Elinka, and thanks for your review. We'll be in touch to send you a book of your choosing. That's all for the announcement, so let's get on with the show. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Lindley Ashline. She's a photographer who creates artwork that celebrates the unique beauty of bodies that fall outside of the conventional beauty standards. Lindley is also the creator of Body Liberation Stock and the Body Love Box, a monthly body acceptance subscription box. She currently lives outside of Seattle with her husband and her two feline overlords. So listen in as two cat ladies, that's me and Lindley, discuss weight stigma, size-inclusive photography, the benefits of exposure and body acceptance work, access, equity, and support for marginalized bodies. Hi, Lindley, and welcome to Real Health Radio. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to have you here on the podcast. I'm very excited to talk with you and get to know you more and to learn from you. But before we get into our conversation, do you mind just introducing yourself, who you are, and what you do to the listeners? Sure. My name is Lindley. It's spelled L-I-N-D-L-E-Y, but because I'm Southern, I don't pronounce the D, so it's just Lindley. Uh, And I'm a photographer and artist. I currently live outside Seattle, Washington. Uh, I do all sorts of body positive and fat positive photography. And so that includes client photography, like portraits and boudoir and small business uh, branding sessions. Uh, I also do stock photos, which has been a really cool thing because I'm currently the only person in the world producing uh, fat positive, fat centered commercial use stock photography. And I also run a subscription box that's called the Body Love Box. So I have my fingers in a lot of different pies and, and that makes me really happy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I love the work that you do, and I'm so excited to dive into our conversation around that. But before we do that, do you mind telling us a little bit about your relationship with food and body growing up? And historically, it's something we talk about with every guest on this podcast, and I'd love to get to know more about you in that way as well. So I had a bit of an unusual relationship with food and my body and with pop culture and diet culture as a kid, because I grew up without a TV. I lived in rural North Carolina, and I was kind of isolated. So, and and I was the I was that kid who would rather like go into the woods and have a pretend tea party with the fairies than than like go to the mall. So I just didn't really have a whole lot of exposure to pop culture as a kid. And what that meant for me was that until I was a teenager and started sort of connecting more with the rest of the world, I just didn't have negative thoughts about my body. I just didn't. I just didn't really think about my body at all. It existed. It was a tool for me to, you know, go outside and play with or ride my bike or climb a tree. But 
but it just wasn't, I wasn't aware of it being a, a cisgender female body or of it being a body that might not be okay in the way that diet culture and pop culture teach us. So, so the first time I got catcalled, it was a huge surprise because I just wasn't used to thinking about my body. Um, and I was, at the time I was adolescent and I was on the side of the road looking for, <laughs> looking for like rock specimens or something. And, and I got catcalled and it was, it was a, a fundamental shock that other people were looking at my body and judging it. It just literally hadn't occurred to me. So with food growing up, I just, I ate when I was hungry. I didn't eat when I wasn't hungry. Um, I rested when I was tired. I moved my body when I wanted to go play. And it was a very sort of simple relationship. And so I just wasn't absorbing until I was a teenager. I wasn't absorbing diet culture. I just wasn't. And so I didn't get, I mean, it was also, you know, I, I regret missing a whole generation, my own generation of pop culture <laughs> because, because whatever movie you're talking about, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get pop culture references. But at the same time, I wasn't absorbing diet culture. And so now, when I was a teenager and I started being more uh, connected to the world around me, and uh, I was an average-sized kid, um, but when I hit puberty, my body all of a sudden took the shape that every woman in my family has. We're all German peasants. And, and once my body took that shape, people started noticing and judging, and I got a lot of negative feedback about my body. Suddenly, I was very aware of it. But even then, I had this foundation where I hadn't absorbed those diet culture messages. And so when I discovered body acceptance in my mid-20s, it wasn't – I don't have like a dramatic story of healing from diet culture. And, and, and so it's a bit unusual because people are like, well, how did you do it? How did you get to a point where you accepted your body? And for me, that journey was very easy because I didn't have as many fish hooks to pull out. So my relationship with my with my body and food growing up was was relatively in the world we live in a relatively healthy relationship because I just wasn't it didn't occur to me that there was anything wrong with me or or wrong with the way that I ate food. Yeah, that is rare and oddly enough that's my story too. So listeners of this podcast who have heard the episodes where I've shared my history are going to say we're two peas in a pod because my story is the same. I was much more interested in playing and art and being active. And my parents and my family were just totally intuitive around food. And yes, food was a big part of our lives and of our gatherings and our time together in a celebratory fashion and a connecting fashion, but it wasn't judged and we weren't made to go on diets and no one was critiquing my body. My sister and I have very different body types, but no one was critiquing our bodies against one another. And we didn't really make those connections either. Like you said, until, you know, adolescence, things like that, you start learning the way that the world is viewing bodies. But it's so interesting for me to hear you say, you know, a body acceptance generally came pretty easy to you because of that, because I, I was curious. And one of the questions I had been hoping to ask you was, was about that the moment where now you're this voice of body liberation in the world and you speak strongly and articulately about the issues related to bodies and weight stigma and oppression, not just around size, but also gender and sexuality and race and, and ability status. So what happened? What caused that shift for you? I'm wondering if it was like this aha moment where you're like, here's a pivot point and this is what I'm doing in the world, or was it like a series of events and circumstances that led you into this work and using your voice in this way? Um, it was, you know, it would be fun if I had that sort of exciting epiphany moment to share, but I don't really. It was a series of very, very small, you know, sort of events over time and, and mostly internet-based because I'm essentially a creature of caffeine and the internet. And and so back in the live journal days in like 2007, 2008, I discovered a live journal group called Fashionista. And that was all these amazing, wonderful fat women. I'm using fat as a neutral descriptor here, not as a, not as a judgment. But, but these wonderful fat women who were completely rocking plus size clothing. And as a younger adult, I, you know, I had learned at that point, I had internalized that I should feel terrible about my fat body. But it was just sort of, again, because I had not been exposed to a lot of the 
specific strategies for what you're supposed to do when you have a bad body. Um, I, in the early 2000s, I embarked on, I was going to, I was going to diet. <laughs> <laughs> and my version of dieting, because because again, I hadn't been, I hadn't grown up listening to commercials for South Beach or Atkins or whatever, and and so my version of dieting was to eat a lot of cucumber and nothing but cucumber for like three weeks, and and of course it made me hungry and cranky, and I lost like three pounds, and that was it. So so at that point, a much younger Lindley said, well, clearly dieting dieting doesn't work for this body, so I, you know I'm I'm a failure. But I'm just, I don't actually care enough about becoming a not failure at dieting to like seek out anything specific. So that was my one bout with dieting. But, but a few years after that, uh, I discovered this life drawing community and there were these women who were like wearing tight skirts and wearing bright colors and being fashionable and stylish. And, and it was just amazing. Like it was a big fundamental shift for me, but I don't know that it was like, one event. It was very gradual over a few years. And so I started thinking about larger bodies as, as bodies that could be worthy and stylish and fashionable. And I'm not a, a person who is particularly involved in fashion myself, but seeing others have access to that was kind of a gateway for me that, oh, fat bodies can also be athletic. Fat bodies can be all these other things that that we assume that people in smaller bodies would have access to. So from there, it was sort of this gradual unfolding of, oh, well, if people in a body like mine can be fashionable, oh, well, then they can be athletic and they can be this and this and this and all the other things, like full access to the world around us. And then it sort of, it sort of came like, I don't know, like a, a ripple in a pond that sort of expands and then comes back. Because then as I realized that there were, all these wonderful things that people in smaller bodies can do, that people in fat bodies can also do. Then the sort of ripple hit the edge of the pond and came back to me that, yes, fat people can be athletic, but if we can't get athletic gear, how are we supposed to go do that? Like somebody in my body is per perfectly capable of learning to kayak. And that's something I've wanted to do for a long time. But finding, you know, if I just go out and run a kayak, there's not going to be one that fits me. <laughs> so so the the fact that the world... Um, was built to exclude these bodies that should be perfectly capable of full participation in the public sphere, um, it, it kind of felt like a slap in the face. Like, now that I believe that big bodies are worthy of doing these things, I'm discovering as I look around that big bodies can't do these things because people in smaller bodies have decided that we shouldn't be able to do these things. And so they've limited access. <laughs> so that you know, sure, in theory, you could go scuba diving, but good luck finding a wetsuit. Um, you know, sure, you can go skiing, but good luck finding ski pants. <laughs> so so I started to get mad. I'll be honest. I started to get mad. Like, you know, I've been, I've been taught that I'm not worthy of doing these things. And now that I believe that I'm worthy, I can't because I don't have access. And then, you know, and so I started to get mad. And the more I looked around, around me, the more mad I got. And that's, that's why I do talk about, you know, things like full, full, you know, access for gender rights and, and disability rights and things that aren't, you know, and those things, I don't live those experiences. I'm a cisgender white woman. Um, and so I don't necessarily have expertise in the lived experience of being someone who is in the LGBT community or a person of color or a person with, um, a person who uses a mobility aid like a wheelchair. Um, I don't have that experience, but I'm mad on their behalf too. <laughs> you know, I want them to have full access to everything too. Um, because you can't say, I mean, I guess you can, but it would be terribly hypocritical to say, oh, well, you know, it's okay to love your body as long as. You can't put caveats on that. You can't, you can't say it's okay for people to have full access to the world as long as. It has to be true for everybody or it doesn't count. Right. And, and I like what you said there just about the fact that, and I've seen you express this online and in other places, the idea that you don't have those lived experiences and yet you're, you're still, first of all, angry on their behalf, second of all, willing to continue to learn. And because I know you and I know your work, also excited about centering individuals who are under other forms of oppression in your work as well. Yeah, and that that was a very deliberate decision that I had to make because 
as a photographer, and don't even get me started on oppression and photography culture. Um, well, we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> oh, good. Because yeah, you're going to get me started. But when I, so when I started photographing people, I had been doing nature photography for a really long time. But when I started photographing people, um, I was on my way out of a really horrible day job. And, and I was, I knew that I wanted to take on photography as a career. But at this point, I had already been involved in the fat acceptance movement for about 10 years. No, seven or eight years at the time. And you know, either as a spectator, you know, reading live journal entries, reading blog posts, and and gradually starting to become a voice myself. So I knew that I wanted to serve fat people in my business. But that is, that is not a standard photography path. Um, in, In the standard, the sort of normal, the normative mainstream photography world, I had hard, a hard time finding resources on working with larger bodies um, as far as posing and so on. I had problems finding respectful resources on working with larger bodies because uh, if, when you look up posing, uh, posing resources for photographers, you find things like, like the one, like the plus size posing will be the afterthought and it will be, it's usually really condescending and it's really like, oh, well, if the mother of the bride is plus size, you know, here's what you might do. Here's what you might do with that. And this is how you end up with, uh, with things like uh, plus size bodies, fat bodies being shoved to the, either the edge of photographs or hidden behind other people um, or cut off in group photos, like they'll be at the end. And then hmm, suddenly on the Instagram version of that photograph, you know, there just wasn't room. So we cut them off. So photography culture is incredibly toxic when it comes to larger bodies. As you, you know, and anybody who's ever been on Instagram for a hot second can see this. <laughs> so this is not this is not a hidden problem within the photography world. So the the point is that I had to make this decision that I was going to make this very non-stream non-mainstream choice and hope that there were enough people out there who wanted that. And when we're talking about centering marginalized bodies in a photography business, a lot of um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of a call out even on some of my <laughs> some of my body positive competitors. Um, a lot of people who claim to be body positive in their photography work somehow larger bodies don't actually make it into their portfolio on their website, or their Instagram feed is full of thin bodies and will have one black body or one fat body and that that is their evidence that they're body positive or that they're inclusive and I decided really early on that that wasn't enough that if I can't center fat and marginalized bodies in my work then that that is not being consistent with my own beliefs and I'll be honest it has been really 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 challenging to continue to center because you when you do that you are going counter to to business theory you're going counter to marketing theory you're going counter to the advice that everyone will want to give you and i do believe that if i were willing to center aspirational bodies and when i say aspirational body i don't even necessarily mean thin although usually when we think of a you know a body that we want ours to be like we do think of thin. Not just that, but heavily photoshopped because everything you see is photoshopped. And so anything that is not looks really strange. And so it's been really challenging to continue to center uh, bodies that are marginalized and bodies that are not photoshopped and still run a business because it is, it's just, it's not only culturally counter to everything that you expect to see in a business. And it also, it's, it's also gets you a lot of, um, Well, if you just, if you would just shift a little bit, you know, it makes people uncomfortable. It makes people uncomfortable. Um, But it also, as customers, we're not used to seeing that. And as photography customers, we are trained to behave as customers to want a photographer who will make us look more like an ideal body. And so I end up doing a lot of customer education as well, because it's really scary to look at a website full of bodies that are visibly fat and are not hiding that. They're not being Photoshopped to look thinner. They're not, 
be imposed in a way that minimizes those bodies and to think, well, I have a body that's big. If I work with a photographer, am I going to look like a fat body on camera, on, on camera in a photograph? That's really scary. And you have to be to, to accept that and to move forward with that with a photographer who's not going to erase you. You do have to be at a certain point in your own journey where you can either be comfortable with that or be willing to use that as a tool to see yourself as you actually exist. So it's scary. Oh, man. You're touching on so many of the topics that I want to talk about. And we got here just from me saying, hey, was it like a aha pivotal moment or this trickle effect that led you to the work you're doing? I now see it was a trickle effect, like the ripples, like you said, and a really beautiful trajectory towards what you're doing now. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question based on right where you ended, which was this idea of photography being, like you said, people either come to you already at a place where they're they're ready to take up space, including in a, yeah. in a photograph, or you said, as as a part of that process of getting ready, of becoming ready to take up space, of allowing themselves to do that. And I wanted to talk to you about this because I know in my work with clients, I encourage them so often to take more pictures of themselves and familiarize themselves with their own body and also to get photography if, if they have access and can afford it. Uh, or find somebody who they trust to take photos of them for this very reason, to familiarize themselves with their bodies and to begin to build that confidence in taking up space in imagery and seeing themselves and recognizing their own bodies, not as other or worse or different, but as worthy of and as them, as who they are. So I'm just wondering, what what are your thoughts and how is that a positive experience to see photographs of yourself? Well, I think the the positive experience, um, it encompasses more than just seeing the photos of yourself, although, of course, that is fundamental. But working with a photographer who is, who is positive about your body, it's a, it's a whole different experience uh, because it means that it's completely a safe place when you come in. Um, we sit down and we talk about, uh, you know, I do ask people, what do you love the most about your body? And also maybe what do you love the least? Um, because if you are not ready to see your stomach and you come in for a boudoir session, your, your stomach is part of your body. You're going to see it in the final photos. <laughs> like you're not, we're, we're not going to pretend you don't have one, but, uh, or, or, or that your, your belly looks any different than it actually looks in real life. But I might not emphasize that as much or depending on the client, I might emphasize it a lot because they're ready to really grasp metaphorically, what their, or maybe literally in some of the photos, what their belly looks like. Uh, so it depends on the client and what they're ready for. But yes, yeah, see, being able to see yourself in the final photos is really a fundamental thing. And it's fascinating the way that people choose to engage with that. Um, I've had some people who, uh, depending on the type of session, sometimes people will get, uh, sometimes they're coming in in person and we're reviewing the photos together. And sometimes they're getting a, a gallery online. And I've had some folks before who have come back to me and said, the first time I looked at my gallery, it's like I couldn't look at myself. And I took two weeks and every day I would open that gallery in a tab and I would look for like two or three minutes and then I'd close the tab. And the next day I'd come back and I would look at myself again. And so some people are ready to see their bodies and some people need, it's literally exposure therapy. <laughs> They literally are, are doing it in like these tiny little snippets until they can see what's actually there. And having professional photos done ourselves particularly because when we have somebody else hold the camera, we're not in charge of the angle. And so so having so it's very different from taking selfies. And so seeing the way that other people are seeing you, um, even if it's just, you know, that, that split second capture that the camera gets as opposed to like a video or see it, or magically seeing yourself, you know, like cloning yourself um, and watching the way that you move. That's sort of the closest we can get. And and just watching people engage with that is so fascinating because like I said, some people are ready for it. They're like, yeah, that's me. That's great. You know, and some people are like, OK, I need I need a minute. <laughs> you know, I need to just gradually expose. And, you know, I was sympathetic to all these different approaches, um, but it really hit home for me when I had my own portraits done uh, a couple years ago. I had to figure out how I was going to engage with photos of myself uh, that were professionally taken. 
And there is a photo of me that I use. I use quite a bit now in my professional presence online, um, but I'm wearing a sleeveless dress and I'm standing in this really narrow brick alleyway up in Victoria in British Columbia. And I have my arms thrown up, like enjoy, you know, so they're, they're like spread wide and my arms are bare. And (laughs) the first time I saw that photo, all I could think of was, oh my God, is that what my arms look like in real life? holy crap, you know, I had no idea, like, and it wasn't, it wasn't that I necessarily thought, oh, my arms are huge, or oh, my arms are a lot smaller than I thought. It was more, oh, I have my grandmother's underarm wings. And I guess I hadn't really realized that before or noticed that. And my, my grandmother on my father's side had these really pronounced, really, really noticeable underarm wings. And she called them her bingo wings. And I guess I hadn't really realized I had inherited that. And that is not something that we value um, in our culture, you know, is is extra skin on the the bottom of our arms. And it took me, like, I had to do my own exposure therapy. I had to, to keep looking at that. And now I love that photo. But it took me a little while. Yeah, it's a good photo. I know as soon as you started describing it, I'm like, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's beautiful. I love hearing it from your perspective, being somebody who's behind the camera so often mm-hmm. and going, yeah, I was in front of the camera and then I received the images and I had to go through my own process of really, it's almost like familiarizing yourself with your own body, which I think is so interesting because we live in our bodies day in and day out. We do all the things in our bodies, but for so many of us, we don't actually take the time to see ourselves and to know ourselves and to recognize that as quote unquote normal, you know, because it's us. And so it should be because we're constantly, like you said, looking at this, these, you know, a barrage of touched up, photoshopped, uh, one particular type of body style sort of image all the time in social media and marketing which brings up something else that you kind of touched on earlier too, which is interesting to me is this idea that, you know, you mentioned like a lot of photographers aren't taking pictures of people in diverse bodies. They're just not. And I, I see that because I see media and marketing every day, but in my actual lived experience of going to the store, picking up my kids at school or any other thing that I choose to do, I am seeing those bodies. So it's so interesting to me that you brought up the point of, oh, well, it's it's hard for people to see their bodies because it's not what they see all the time. It's not something they're familiar with in the imagery that we're typically seeing. And yet in our everyday life, I see every type of body. Yeah. Well, and, and this is, I'll be honest, this is one of the areas where I get mad again. <laughs> Do it. You know, I would not have said until maybe two years ago that that anger was a significant emotion for me or part of my personality, but, but the more that I learn about, um, oppression and marginalization and politics and diet culture and how trauma is expressed in the body and how oppression is expressed in the body and how fat phobia kills, um, the more angry I get. And one of the areas where I get really angry is when people who are invested in diet culture for one reason or another, Um, want to tell me that fat bodies don't belong in the public sphere. And of course, not only are the people living in those fat bodies entitled to just as much access to the world as the rest of us, um, but, and, and and this is uh, quite often when I'm arguing with somebody on Instagram, this is where somebody says, well, what if the person weighs 400 pounds? I mean, I know people who weigh 400 pounds. I know lots of people who weigh 400 pounds. You don't know what 400 pounds looks like. Hush. (laughs) <laughs> you know, but like, like people pick the biggest number and say, oh, but what about that? What about, you know, what about that? And that sort of fear mongering, what if somebody's 600 pounds? Well, of course, some of, there are plenty of people who weigh 600 pounds and they belong, you know, they, they deserve just as much access to Olive Garden as the rest of us. Um, <laughs> and so, so I, I get mad about that. But, but also when people, when, when people who are fat, people with disabilities, people who are otherwise at risk for being abused or, or um, shut out of access, when they don't go out in public, um, because, it, because we have made it very hard for them to go out in public, 
when they when they can't get on the bus because there's you know because people are going to be so nasty to them that it's not worth it to use public transit or because there's not a seat that will fit or there's not a, a spot for their wheelchair when we don't see those people in public it further skews the what become what looks normal to us as far as bodies what looks okay as far as bodies and so so i i think your point is really 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 valuable that if you pay as much attention to the bodies around you in daily life as you do to what you see in a magazine or on Instagram or on Facebook, um, you will start noticing that the bodies around you are normal, <laughs> you know, um, and, the, and that there's a much wider scope of bodies around you. Um, but you still may not be seeing um, extremely marginalized people. And it's because we have created a public space uh, in the U.S. where they are not welcome. And when I say not welcome, I mean they don't we have built an infrastructure where some people don't fit we have built an infrastructure where where some people are visibly not welcome and that does skew because people think that they never see people who weigh 800 pounds i guarantee you first off that you've seen that you've seen people who weigh 800 pounds and you just didn't know it because bodies vary so widely i i weigh 270 pounds and i wear a size 26 28 pants in like lane bryant sizing um, I know people who are half my weight, literally, who wear close to the same size in clothing. And I know people who weigh twice what I do who wear the same size in clothing. So you, you cannot tell what somebody weighs by looking at them. <laughs> but, but when we exclude people from the public sphere and we make them invisible, well, first off, that's really crappy to the actual people in those bodies because they need to be able to get into the grocery store and navigate the aisles too. And it's not fair to shut them out. But it also continues to reinforce that, oh, I, you know, I've never met anyone in an 800-pound body or a 600-pound body. That's not a thing. Like, that's a theoretical person. <laughs> you know, that's not, a, that's not a person whose body could possibly be okay because I can't even imagine it. I was talking with a photographer the other day, and I had to excuse myself from the conversation because this particular photographer did not um, – they were trying to think of a really large size that they could – that they could list in a model call. And the largest size that they could think of was a 14 clothing what? size. Which is the a- average size. I, I had to excuse myself from the conversation. And this is what happens when we prioritize very, very small bodies at the cost of everyone else. We don't, <laughs> we don't know what larger bodies look like. And so, so coming back to the, you know, when, when we think of large bodies and public access, we think of like people of Walmart which is one of the which is one of the most toxic and cruel mm. ideas that anyone could ever have come up with. But when you go to Walmart, look at people and I and don't look at the don't look at what they're wearing. <laughs> don't look at oh well that person is really really fat and they're on a scooter so they must you know they must be lazy and unhealthy and whatever. You know just look at the bodies. Look at the bodies that are actually around you in real life, like Lou was saying, and and you know and internalize that as opposed to. When I scroll through Instagram, all I see is svelte Nordic 18-year-olds, and thus that is, that's what's normal. Like, look at the people actually around you when you go out. Yeah, but I do hear what you're saying, which is even when we look at the people around us when we go out, we're still not seeing the full spectrum of bodies because not most of the places that we go to are accessible to the full spectrum of bodies. And something that has been rocking my world since I interviewed interviewed. Jen McClellan of Plus Mommy, mm. and mm-hmm. she brought up, you know, we were talking about chairs in, in doctor's offices and in restaurants, so seating and uh, airplane seats, and I, I know that you br- have brought up before a moving van that couldn't even fit a friend of yours. Yeah. And, and, you know, all of these places, again, where there isn't access for people in larger bodies, and Jen brought up just, just real, like, you know, it was just like a one-liner in our conversation about how, think about when you park in a parking space, how closely you're parking to the other cars, because all sorts of bodies are coming in and out of these vehicles. And if you park too closely, you might, you know, inhibit someone from actually being able to get whatever done they needed to get done, go to whatever store they needed to do, get out of their vehicle or get back (laughs) in. in. (laughs) Right. And I was like, holy shit, I am 37 years old. I am still learning every day the things I take for granted being in a thinner body and 
still like being fat positive and doing this work and caring so strongly about body liberation. And there's still things I miss. And that has just ever since I don't not think about like, I have to think about it every time I pull into a parking space. But even so that in and of itself probably keeps a lot of people out of the public sphere. Just the fact, just the way that our parking spaces are lined. Oh yeah. I know so many fat people who have horror stories of like, being trapped outside their car in a parking lot because while they were in a store, somebody came and parked right up on their door and they're having to, you know, like crawl through their own trunk <laughs> into their cars and, and, or, or trust that, you know, like there's, you're standing there. Think about, think about what this would feel like. You're standing there in a parking lot. People have parked so closely on both sides of it that you can't get in either of your doors. And you're standing there debating whether you're going to try to like break into your own, own car through the trunk and, and like somehow try to crawl in like at this tiny little space and, you know, humiliate yourself. And somebody comes along and offers to back your car out for you. And not only is that a completely humiliating experience for most of us, you know, that that, that might happen to, but then you have to depend on the kindness of this stranger not to steal your car on top of it. And, and to know, and I, I want to emphasize that part of the background of all of this is to know that when you are in a fat body and something bad happens to you, you will be blamed. And this is true of, of any marginalization, any oppression. If you're in a black body and something happens, something bad happens to you, you're going to be blamed. If you're in a female body, if you're in, if you're in a body with a disability, like, or in an LGBT body, like this is going to be, you know, in the background, in the back of your mind that this is going to be, how can we blame this on you? Um, and honestly, I think the reaction to a local news story where uh, a woman, a fat woman, was trapped outside her car and a, and a man walked up and offered to back it out and then stole it instead, the reaction would be laughter. Like, uh, there were, out of 100 Facebook reacts on that n- local news story, 99 of them would be the, the laughing face. And so you know in the back of your mind all the time that if anything bad happens to you because of your body – most people are just going to think it's funny. <laughs> and so, so, so I get mad about that too. Oh. <laughs> I get, I get mad about that too. Oh, totally. Because as you're talking, I'm like, and this is why the idea of the minority stress theory is so true. And the fact that when you are constantly stigmatized and oppressed, that is doing something to you physiologically, raising your cortisol, messing with your hormones, because you're daily living under that scrutiny and under that fear and like you said, the idea that it's in some way, in any way, it will be blamed on you, which is why a lot of people in marginalized bodies have particular health concerns, not related to their bodies, but related to the stress of being in that body in a culture that's bigoted. I recently started seeing a doctor who, uh, who is very firmly in the health at every size philosophy and framework. And I had had a series of I mean, my entire life, I'd had a series of, of increasingly less fat phobic doctors as I stopped putting up with it and started seeking doctors who wouldn't shame me for living in the body that I live in. Um, but my blood pressure went down 20 points when I had it taken sitting in that health at every size doctor's office. It's 20 points just from sit- being taken in an office where I wasn't stress because I felt like I was either had just been shamed about my weight or was going to be shamed. Yeah. 20 points. I believe it. The body, the body I'm reading through the book, the body keeps the score right now. And it is, it's, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, it's quite academic. It's going to take you a while to work through unless you're used to reading academic material, but it's, it really emphasizes how our bodies tell that tale. But I, I want to come back really quick to um, you were talking about like you just hadn't realized uh, being a person in a somewhat smaller body, how a parking lot, you know, how how strange and terrified an environment uh, like a parking lot might be for someone in a marginalized body. And I have been running um, a, a, priv- a thin privilege series on my Instagram uh, that is primarily meant for people in smaller bodies who just don't realize what it's like to navigate the world in a fat body. And the responses to that have been, again, really fascinating. Um, some of the responses have been, oh my gosh, I live in a thin body and I had no idea, no idea that this was, you know, the, the same na- environment that I'm navigating with no problem 
is, you know, designed to exclude you. Um, but the other, to be honest, the primary, <laughs> the primary um, response that I get from people, and sometimes it's outright trolling, and sometimes it's just people who don't get it and don't want to, um, because they've never had to face any kind of oppression, and they just, they can't grapple with it, is you deserve that. And some people are softer about it, and some people are, are harsher about it. But the message is, you deserve that because of the body you live in. You deserve that because I'm not going to list them um, because I don't want you to internalize them any more than you have to. But, I, you know, insert anti-fat stereotype here. You, okay, I'll list, I'll list two. Um, you deserve that because you don't have the self-discipline to have a thin body. You deserve that because, you know, because you're too lazy to have a thin body. And like I said, you can fill in the rest yourself. But it's been really interesting to watch that because this this notion of deserving is is just it's fascinating and it's depressing <laughs> because these are people who are saying that I don't deserve to be able to sit down in my doctor doctor's waiting room. These are people who believe I don't deserve to have a seat when I have to go to the emergency room. Um, these are people who believe I don't deserve to fly on an airplane or to you or to sit down on a bus or a train or to be able to sit down at a restaurant. And a lot of it comes just comes back to seating because that's very visible. But people who think I don't deserve to have health care that doesn't consist just of lose weight. Or learn to kayak. Or yeah, the people who think I don't deserve to ski or to kayak or to ride a horse or to and yes, there are horses that that are bread to carry heavier weight people. Um, Because that's one that always comes up like animal cruelty. No, no, no. I'm not talking about riding a pony (laughs) in my 270 pound body. But like a Clydesdale can carry me. Come on. At any rate, these are people who think that I don't deserve to have full access to daily life. People who think I don't deserve to be able to get to an office so I can work. People who don't think I don't, yeah, who think I don't deserve to live. And they've been taught that. This doesn't come out of a vacuum. And when you see these responses and you see these trolls, dozens of trolls every day, over and over and over, the the sort of the through lines become very clear. And there's so much fear in this. There's so much fear because, you know, of course, fat people are taught that we don't deserve to have access. But thin people are taught that they better not, you know, become fat or they will no longer deserve access. Right. And people, there's so much fear in this trolling. There's so much fear in these responses because when they say you don't deserve it because what that means is that if they ever show the slightest sign of any of those things that they assume fat people do all the time, you know, if I eat an extra donut and I want to, I want to be clear here that we know from actual science that fat people and thin people eat about the same types of food and about the same quantities, but Thin people are taught that if you eat an extra donut or if you did donut at all, if you eat sugar, if you eat, you know, if you have the regular pasta instead of the whole grain pasta, if you have, you know, if you rest when you're tired instead of going to the gym, that that is, that's the slippery slope to becoming like me. And that means that you will no longer deserve access to the world. How terrifying must that be? I mean, I grew up, you know, I've, I've been fat since puberty. So my entire adult life, I've known that the world thinks I don't deserve to have nice things. But how, how terrifying must it be to be in a thin body and be scared of, you know, sinning all the time or proving yourself unworthy. And then suddenly you're in the outcast class. Mm-hmm. It must be terrifying to live with all the time. Right. I mean, not as, not as terrifying as not being able to access the public sphere already, but <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And you listed the two types of clients that we work regularly with here at Seven Health is, you know, it's either people who are in thin bodies who are afraid for whatever reason of gaining weight, of getting larger, who are experiencing disordered eating and eating disorders, or people in larger bodies who are experiencing disordered eating and eating disorders, negative body image, again, at, at either side of the spectrum but who are there already experiencing the bigotry, the shaming, the concern trolling that happens. And then the, the, you know, like I said before, the previous group of people are the ones who are afraid of experiencing it, whether that's a conscious fear or it's subconscious. But what I find so interesting about this whole conversation and about trolls in general is they're so quick to put the onus on individuals. It could be really alleviating and kind of like lift all this fear, I guess, except for the fear of change. But... Mm -hmm. 
it really could alleviate a lot of fear to say, hey, you know what? Our system's broken. Our, our culture has some changing to do. We could do. We could shift this together when it comes to the places and spaces and situations, or we could just put the onus on somebody who's fat. Like, I, I guess what I guess I that's what's hard for me to understand is it, what harm does it do to a concern troll to start trolling the systems that are doing this troll the <laughs> air, airline industry, you know, troll the people who decide. So what the municipalities, the, the cities, the counties that decide where to paint the lines for parking? Like, why are we not trolling these people? And instead, we're trolling the people who are negatively impacted from those choices. I don't get it, but I will say that it took me time obviously living in a privileged body to, to see that. And I'm still seeing it as I shared. So it's no condemnation to anybody who's listening. Who's like, Whoa, mind is being blown. Let it be blown. And then, <laughs> and then let it be blown again and again, as we continue to shift the focus from someone living in a larger body or an otherwise marginalized body to the systems that are keeping them oppressed. You know, I think it comes back to the just world hypothesis. Um, and I've actually, as we're talking, I've actually pulled this up in my browser so that I can I can read you the proper definition. But the just world hypothesis, uh, thanks Wikipedia for this definition, is the cognitive bias or assumption that a person's actions are inherently inclined to bring morally fair and fitting consequences to that person, to the end of all noble actions being eventually rewarded and all evil actions eventually punished. And I, I talk about this quite a bit in my work in, in various forums because because that is what diet culture, that's one of the fundamental parts of diet culture. And it's also one of the fundamental parts of ableism is this, it, it feels very simple in that it gives us this, this really, it's a false, it's false and it's toxic, but it's also really simple and easy. Um, it gives us this, if you have been a bad person and done bad things, then that is expressed in your body. If you have been virtuous and done good things, then good things will come to you, and thus that will also be tied to your physical body. And and so diet culture gives us this this super awesome shorthand that says if you live in a fat body, you are a long list of negative things here. I, I mentioned a couple of them earlier. Um, if you are in a thin body, then you have done things right, and you have been rewarded with a thin body. Um, and of course, that ignores science and genetics and reality in general. But this just world, it, it's very, it's very simple, and it's very easy to fall into and stay into because it just gives you this wonderful shorthand. Um, if you, you know, and and I don't, I don't want to uh, repeat or emphasize bigotry here, but similar things for people who have visible disabilities or even invisible disabilities, um, chronic illnesses, where. Uh, you know, those things have been, it's like the inverse of the body keeps the score where we talk about trauma being expressed in the body. This is like the, the bizarro world toxic version of that. Like virtue or something. Right, right. And and this is why if you think about, um, if you think about Disney villains, like think about Jafar, like, uh, you know, when, when, when the Disney Aladdin movie came out, the original animated one um, came out, I was pretty young, but like I took one look at Jafar and I knew he was going to be a bad guy. You know, you look at Ursula, look at Ursula and you know, she's going to be a bad guy. And you look at all these villains and like I said, I grew up without a TV. So I'm sure there are a thousand more examples across, across media, but it's because their, their negative traits have been expressed in their body. So they are deformed. They look strange. They don't look normal. They, you know, they don't look okay. Uh, or think about, you know, like the pirate with the peg leg, <laughs> you know, it's this really, this really direct and again, very toxic. Um, or, you know, Captain Hook with his hook hand. That's what I was thinking of. But this very direct, the body is an indicator of character. Um, and so it's a super easy shortcut. And again, the fact that it's not true doesn't mean that it's not emphasized. And diet culture emphasizes that. And, and that's part of that fear, too, that if, you know, if I become fat, it proves I'm a bad person. It shows the whole world that I'm a bad person. And so, again, there's this fear keeping people in line. Oh, totally. That's and oh, and so, so coming back to the trolls, that's if you the, part of this just world thing is that there are a lot of um, there are a lot of rewards to perpetuating oppression. Um, so if I 
if I go troll somebody um, because I'm not like that person and I don't want to be like that person, I'm reinforcing in my own mind the the fact that I'm not like that person right. because, you know, maybe I didn't go to the gym today, but I'm not like that person. And I'm feeling really threatened by this person existing. So I'm going to go reinforce that I'm not like you. Um, and the, But then also there's... So this is this is a little bit inside baseball, and this is this is very um, of its place and time. So I don't want to go into a lot of details, details about it. But there has been um, there has been a pretty high profile um, cluster on <laughs> on Instagram where um, there's a, a particular group of fat activists who've been targeted by a particular group of really dedicated trolls that are all very um, based around a particular guy who runs some online fitness accounts. And these are all people who are very, 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 very involved in bodybuilding, gym, fitness, culture. And they have been very making these very high-profile attacks on a bunch of fat activists on Instagram. And they are a really good example of uh, how there are rewards to reinforcing oppression. Because every time one of these dudes goes and trolls a fat activist, he's also proving to his friends that I'm one of you. I'm not like them. They don't deserve to have nice things. And I'm reinforcing that because I'm one of you. I'm a good person. And so every person who sneers at people of Walmart, every person who um, doesn't hire a particular professional because they would rather go with a, a, a thinner professional instead, every person who every person who is a concerned troll on Instagram, every person who chooses diet culture over body freedom. And again, that doesn't mean that you're a bad person um, because there's a certain amount of protection in that. Um, if you are a thin person who picks a fat photographer, that is, that's a, that's a brave choice in the world we live in, um, in the sense that, you know, you could choose to be associated with someone who is higher in the hierarchy and thus associate yourself with those positive traits that we assign people. So, so I'm not saying that if you have ever, if you've ever, if you've ever had a talk with your niece about, you know, I'm just worried about your health. Um, if you have ever, you know, done some things that, and you're feeling a little called out right now, um, that's good. You probably need to feel called out. And, you know, like I said, I'm the angry, shouty lady on the Internet, so I'm probably the one to do it. But but I'm not saying that that makes you a, like inherently a bad person um, because aligning ourselves with oppressive systems has rewards. There are social rewards in that. There's safety in that. And, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm getting a little muddled here about it, but because I feel so strongly, but these people who were trolling, people who are making choices to invest in diet culture, there's safety in that. Because let me tell you how much crap I get from, from even people that I'm close to sometimes about my choice to not diet. My, you know, my mother feels differently than I do about it, uh, about diet culture and about dieting. And we have occasional discussions where I reinforce, have to reinforce that I'm not going to diet even now. And my entire career is based on anti-diet concepts. Um, and so, so I've lost friends when I stopped. When I stopped participating in diet culture, I lost friends. Um, I have had family members sort of drift away, and that's fine because – you know, they're full human beings. They get to make decisions too. And I have found, I've found wonderful friends. I've found amazing colleagues. I have, I have the most incredible clients. You know, it's like the people who buy my subscription box, like say, you know, you're making a real difference in the world. And that's amazing. But there's safety in going with the mainstream. And every time you post uh, an anti-diet meme to your Facebook page, that can be hard and scary when you start doing it because it's not safe. It's not you know, you, you risk losing the rewards of privilege and of you risk re losing the rewards of thinness. If you don't live in a thin body and you participate in diet culture and you stop doing that, you risk losing that reward. Like you, you miss, you miss out on approval. You miss out on belonging. You miss out on sometimes physical safety and that's hard. And so the people who are the loudest I mean, I'm not in their heads, but the people who are the loudest proponents of diet culture, I just assume they're the ones who are most afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I can only really relate it to, I mean, obviously I'm doing this work too. And so I see the concern trolling and I, I get the fear side of it as well. In my personal life, I can relate it to 
I am the survivor of religious trauma. So (laughs) in that way, it is very similar. This idea, like you're speaking of, of the just world and some of the experiences that I have had with religion and, and the ideas around you're in or you're out. Here's what keeps you safe. Here's what keeps you not safe. You're safer still if you call out people that are out. And you make more of a fuss about people who are on that side of the line, because that way you can remind yourself that you're in, that you're safe, that you're still okay. And I can understand that human nature side of it, of wanting survival and wanting to make sure that your place in, uh, in the group is secure. I I see that. And also it causes a ton of harm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this concern trolling thing, we're like hitting on, we're just randomly talking. (laughs) I like it because I'm like, I feel like we're just hanging out and like, oh yeah, that, yeah, that. But we're hitting (laughs) on so many of the things that I had wanted to talk to you about because concern trolling was certainly one of them. And I want to bring that back as you were sharing about this idea of, of the safety in either calling people out for their bodies, uh, putting the onus and the responsibility on them and continuing to try to make people in larger bodies or other marginalized bodies invisible, bringing that back to photography. Do you think that's the same reason why most photographers aren't taking pictures of a range of body types? Um, You know, I'm sure that there is a component of that. I think when you run a small business um, and I, I want to, I want to note here that I have the privilege as a, as a business owner, um, my spouse has supported me financially um, and emotionally. And, you know, he's, he's a fantastic person. We've been married. We were high school sweethearts. We were married. We've been married for a really long time and I love him very much, but he's also supporting me financially um, because small businesses, um, particularly as inequality grows in the United States and, and, you know, in small, small businesses are precarious. The small business failure rate is like, I don't know, 95%. So, so those of us who have some sort of privilege in in financially or or connections or whatever have a huge advantage here. And and so I I broke even on my business for the first time last year. Um it took me 4 years. And that doesn't mean that I'm paying myself or that I'm making money. It just means that it, the business itself broke even. Um and so so I have a huge amount of privilege in that I'm able to do this work. But all businesses, all small businesses are precarious. And so when you're running a small business, particularly if you are not deeply, deeply convicted about the worth of all bodies and a conviction to center the bodies that get ignored the most, I mean, honestly, it just makes financial sense to go with the most mainstream market where you think you can make money. Um, and of course, it would also make sense to be, well, nobody is serving Nobody's serving fat people in my, in my market, in my area, geographically, you know, I should do that. Um, but that's when our internal prejudices take hold because particularly in, in any sort of business that's related to art, when all the artwork we see is centered on thin bodies, when all of that, you know, everything we see and everything we're trained to do is centered on thin bodies, that's when diet culture and fat phobia and prejudices take over and, and prevent us from seeking out markets of marginalized people. And honestly, as a business owner, I'll just say too, that it's hard to serve marginalized people as a small business owner, um, because marginalized people make less money and have less access to services. <laughs> so, uh, and so, and also are trained to, uh, trained by all of our culture to hate themselves. And so, so when I work with I work with fat and marginalized clients. Um, These are people who have overcome internalized self-hatred. They've overcome financial barriers that thinner people don't have because we know that fat people are paid much, much less than their thinner counterparts. Um, They have overcome a bunch of hurdles to come see me. And again, because I have the the financial privilege to offer these services that are centered on large bodies, I am able to hold that space specifically for fat and marginalized bodies. But if I were a single mom or I were in a thin body and just didn't, you know, hadn't really been exposed to these concepts, or if I were firmly, firmly convicted about these concepts, then, you know, I would probably be out there with, you know, only serving thin people too. (laughs) You know, so, so yes, 
yes, of course, you know, photographers and all business owners should be making their services inclusive. Um, but at the same time, I don't agree with not being inclusive and not being, you know, not being good at serving large bodies, but I get it too. I get why people don't, because if I needed, you know, if I desperately needed to pay my rent, yeah, I'd probably be out there photoshopping people too, to be honest. Yeah. And so I hear what you're saying is something that we've echoed in other places and spaces as well. Those people with the most privilege have the greatest responsibility yes. of, of doing this work. It shouldn't be on the shoulders of the people who are marginalized. It shouldn't be on the shoulders of the people who aren't privileged in other areas financially or the like, but the people who do have privilege in this case, you're saying as, as a small business owner, you have the privilege of another source of income through your partner. And that is, that's something that you know, and you can rely on. And because of that, you have more opportunity to do this work. I really think that that's so valuable to hear because it, we could spread, we could share that same sentiment across all things. Those of us in thinner bodies have a responsibility, have the privilege of being able to, like you talked about earlier, I have the privilege of being able to post anti-diet memes all day and I'm going to get way less of the troll. And it's, I still get trolls, but not nearly as many as somebody who is in a larger body who posted an anti-diet meme is going to get. Mm -hmm. And so I have more privilege, so I can speak up more. I can do it more often. I can use the platforms I have to be able to speak in that way, the same way with ability status, the same way people of color should not be the ones responsible for fixing the system that's broken and build against them. This is a message that we can share across the board. So I love that you brought that into, hey, as a small business owner, we have varying amounts of privilege. And here's how I'm using mine. For other people who are privileged and maybe are photographers or artists and their curiosity is beginning to be sparked by what you're sharing. What's your advice for getting into the work of being more inclusive? How, how do they start? Well, I actually, I have so many thoughts about this that I'm, I'm literally writing a book. Uh, it's called body liberation for business and it's, I'm, I'm working on writing it. I don't have a release date yet, but uh, but there are just there's so many components, and I'm I'm sitting here trying to sort of condense it. I think the first thing I would say is unless you have been involved in this, the work of um, the work of identifying and dealing with your own internalized uh, fat phobia for a long time, is to work on that first, because you cannot possibly. You can't pursue, oh, I'm going to serve people in fat bodies as a business strategy if you don't like fat bodies. And I don't, and by like, I don't mean I'm sexually attracted to. I mean respect and treat like normal human bodies. <laughs> um, if you think fat bodies are weird and gross, it's going to come out in how you interact with people. Like, we're not stupid. <laughs> we can tell when people think we're gross. So, <laughs> so you have to deal with that first because if you start – I'm just gonna I'm gonna just pick photography because that's my that's my jam. Um, if you start photographing fat bodies when you don't like or understand fat bodies, the client will be uncomfortable or the model. It will come out in the photos. They'll look awkward and weird and you know because they're uncomfortable and it will be very clear. And clients aren't gonna like working with you. So first you got to deal with that. And there are many many strategies already on the internet for dealing with internalized fat phobia. But the the big one, the one that was a big deal for me, coming back to those live journal days and seeing people in fat bodies, find people in fat bodies on Instagram, follow them. Find, you know, find body positive accounts and, and fat positive accounts on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and follow them. Start absorbing large bodies. Like surround yourself with that. Pay extra attention to the bodies you see in the world. Then I think... Uh, in the photography world, posing is what you would absorb if you went out and you looked at posing in the photography world today is that fat bodies are some sort of strange other species who require very delicate handling and must be posed in a certain way that minimizes them. Um, and honestly, screw that. <laughs> you yeah. know, just pose, just pose bodies. And now it is true that that very, very small bodies, um, like they physically move and and – interact with themselves differently than a very fat body. A very fat body is going to do different things when you put them in a, in, in a specific pose, pose A. 
than a very thin body would look like in pose A. And it doesn't mean that pose A just doesn't work on large bodies. But there will be some times, um, say you have, and this is the same when you work with someone who has any sort of mobility limitations too. Say that this person is, you stick them on their, it's, it's a boudoir session. You stick them on their back on a bed and they've got their legs up the wall. Well, some people's legs are going to cross at different points than others. But the fundamentals of the pose are still the same. And it doesn't mean that that fat, fat body isn't going to work in that pose or that that fat, fat body can't do that pose. It just means that they may need to have their legs parallel to each other instead of crossed. You know, it's not like fat bodies aren't some weird other species of <laughs> that require an entirely different set of poses unless you were dedicated to minimizing those bodies. And that's mm -hmm. why you hear a lot in the photography world that, oh, this, this pose just doesn't work for anybody who's not really thin. It's not that it doesn't work. It just that it's just that it looks different and it doesn't it doesn't minimize the body in the way that you prefer. So if you are dedicated to minimizing bodies, I was going to say don't bother trying to work with fat people. But honestly, there will be there will be fat people who want their bodies to be minimized. And that can be I think it's still it's not the um ideal offering for for a client base, I think, but that can be a really important gateway too. Just just allowing people to 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 see themselves even if the poses are like sort of traditional minimizing ones, I think that can be an important gateway. So, I mean, you know, five years from now, Lindley may listen to this recording later and go, what were you thinking telling people that? But even if you can give people a gateway into seeing themselves, that can be important too. So any step that you can make to let fat people see themselves and to see other people in bodies like theirs, um, as long as that is not a shaming context. Because I'm not saying that you should come in and say, well, because you got a big old booty, I'm just going to Photoshop it to be smaller. That's not what I'm talking about. But taking boudoir as an example, because boudoir is one of the most um, posed of all the types of current uh, current portrait photography styles. Um, boudoir has their very specific poses that you need to get people into, very specific, like back arching and you know, put, popping your boobs out and, and very specific leg crossing and very specific poses to look sexy. And even if you are sticking with, sticking with those poses, just letting fat people access them is a start. <laughs> so, so I think, I think any incremental move you can make towards non-shaming representation of fat bodies in your work is a good one. Like you don't have to go from being aspirational bodies only in your portfolio to like my my level of wild eyed activism. You don't <laughs> you don't have to do that all at once. But any step you can make, even if you are just putting one one fat person in your portfolio in beautiful non shaming poses, that counts. Even if you're putting, you know, more people of color in, even if you're just one step. But to do that step Again, if you're going to do that step and you are not going to perpetuate fat phobia via your business, you have to work on that first. After you've worked on that, I think it will become more clear to you how you can work with clients in a non-shaming way and how you can start representing. So I think, I think the, the root of it is really do that work first. Fine, you know, go look up Jess Baker and look at Jess Baker's books. That's a great, really easy entry point if you are not, you know, if you don't have any idea where to start. Just start, start following fat people on Instagram. And the more that you get used to seeing those bodies, the more you'll get used to seeing the beauty in those bodies. So it's not like I don't want you to go out there and photograph people or draw people because you feel like you have to. Because, again, that'll come through. I want you to, I want you to get to a point where you can do that because you see value in those bodies artistically. And if you can get to that point, then, it, then you'll see where the first steps are, I think. That's really great advice. I do think you're right. The work starts there of, of working on your own internal biases and, and then working towards fat acceptance and broadening the scope of the people that you see and the bodies that you embrace and celebrate. Of course, that'll translate into your work, into the work of photography or art, because the one thing we need, well, the thing we don't need any more of is photographs of people in larger bodies looking sad or... <laughs> 
yes. suffering or without heads or whatever the typical uh, photographs are. We don't need more of that. We do need more of people celebrating all bodies and all shapes. And this leads to a question I have about a word that particularly <laughs> comes up with uh, my clients a lot. And I am really quick to jump on and I'm so curious to hear what you have to say about it. And that's the term flattering. I, for me and the work that I do, when most of my clients bring up the term flattering, they're talking about flattering as in, does this outfit make me look smaller? Mm -hmm. Do I take up less space? They're talking about flattering, meaning getting them closer to the cultural beauty ideals and standards. So for me, I'm like, stop talking about flattering. Actually, no, what we really do is we do an <laughs> exercise. What we really do is we do an exercise where we reframe what flattering means and we get, I have my clients define it for themselves based on their core values. Mm -hmm. And, and then that's how they approach an outfit that makes them feel, you know, joyful or more like themselves, comfortable in their own, you know, whatever it is. But I'm curious for you as a photographer, you must hear the word flattering all the time. And I'm wondering how you deal with it, how you handle it, how you use the word. Oh, so many thoughts here. So, so, and this, this ties right back into posing because when we talk about posing, it's always, oh, well, it's whatever is going to be the most flattering to this body. And it's absolutely 100%. When we say flattering, we mean as thin as possible. Right. Um, there, there's no question there. And, you know, on a personal level, oh, screw flattering. Because, you know, the thing is that flattering is also one of those concepts that's only apl applicable to a body or up to a certain size. At my size, there is very little that, like, when I think about clothing, um, there are only a, there's not a whole lot of clothing that would be quote flattering unquote to a body that is that, that is shaped like mine. Um, when you are say ten clothing sizes larger than I am, there is nothing that's going to make you look thin. <laughs> so, so flattering doesn't even apply. So it's yet another one of these concepts that that is gatekeeping and exclusive because if you can even access flattering you have a certain amount of body privilege. And, you know, so, so not only is it a toxic concept on several levels, just as a concept, but it only applies to certain people anyway. And so, so on a personal level, just screw flattering altogether, like wear what you want, do what you want. And, you know, and like, but I also want to point out that there are, there's once again, safety and a social, a certain level of social reward in being flattering. I get treated when I go out in my daily life, I'm treated better if I am wearing clothes that one might call flattering, that clothes that are meant to make me look as small and taking up the least space possible um, than I do when I'm wearing what is comfortable and what I enjoy wearing, which today happens to be Hello Kitty jammy pants because I'm working, you know, I'm just at home today. So I have Hello Kitty jammy pants on and a, and a hoodie. Um, but if I go out wearing this, I'm treated very differently than I might if I were wearing things that were very structured and wearing all black and wearing things that are cut in a certain way that are, you know, that it's meant to, to minimize me. And I have the freedom and the privilege because I run my own business. I can say screw flattering as a business owner who has clients who come in in a pretty wide range of places in their own body image journeys. I have to, to a certain extent, I have to meet clients where they're at and and I am general, like people know when they come to work with me, I'm not going to Photoshop you to look thinner. I'm not going to minimize your body. Um, but I might, as I am running through my posing choices in my head, if, it, if I have a client who is, who's not ready for like full on, I'm fat, here's my fat body and all its fatness, you know, I might choose poses that are slightly more minimizing than I might for other people because the goal is for them to be able to see their body. And even if they have to do that little exposure thing and, you know, expose themselves to it gradually, if I shock them so fundamentally that they can't even do that with their photos, then I have negated the, the, the reason that they're here. Um, and so I'm not ever going to do, like I said, the extreme flattering stuff like Photoshopping fat rolls off or, or like really extreme, minimizing posing, but I might tilt the session in one way or another, depending on where the client is in their journey, because they just, they need to be able to access their own bodies in a way that meets them where they are. And that makes a ton of sense. Thanks for sharing that because yeah, flattering, whether it's in photographs or when we're talking about clothing. Yeah. I, I haven't 
found a definition of it except for the complete rewrites that I do with my clients to make it personal to them. There's really no definition that to me doesn't really just insinuate being smaller. But I see how when you're sharing working with people who are just getting acquainted with seeing their own bodies and familiarizing themselves with them and learning to accept and appreciate them that yeah, you probably have to work with a a wide range of clientele who might have different ideas about what flattering is and what they need from your session. So thanks for educating me on that. I know we're running up towards the end of time and I could talk to you for another hour and a half, but I don't, (laughs) I don't want to end this conversation without hearing from you about your stock photography, because I think it's super important aside from the clients and people who are struggling with body image and their food relationship who listen. We have a ton of practitioners and other professionals who listen to this podcast, and I want them to know where they can find stock photography that's going to center all bodies. Yeah. So in, in 2016, I started, I started my client photography in 2015. And in 2016, I realized that because I had done, at this point, I had done so much work and so much thinking around what bodies we see where and, and all the things that we've talked about in this podcast already um, and, you know, and that we don't see big bodies in the mainstream um, unless it's like, uh, you know, like the, this one, um, I don't want to say token because that's, it's not necessarily always a token fat person, but in the, in the sort of social, social justice sense, but, but just like, there's always like one fat celebrity we can think of or one fat I don't know. I can't think of any super famous fat photographers off the top of my head, but but like generally there's sort of there's one or two in the public sphere of fat people that we can think of, but that's not really representation. That's just like one example. Um, but that's also true. Part of why we never see fat bodies in the media is because so much of the media and advertisement and marketing, all these worlds, run on stock photos. And when you go look at like go look at Getty. Go look at iStock photo. Go look at, I don't know, deposit photos, all these different stock photo sites. And what you see is thin bodies and only thin bodies. And what that means is that the millions of people out there who need stock photos for their businesses don't have any choices. So part of the reason that all we see is thin bodies is because that's all that's offered on the stock photo side. Because anybody who doesn't have the budget to, like, hire a photographer and roll their own photo shoot for their, for their business is buying stock photos. And when the only stock photos that are available are these very normative ones, well, that's what we see. So I found this magical way to change culture with like one person and one camera and a whole bunch of people who were willing, who are willing to step up and represent for people who look like them. Uh, so I started creating stock photos. I, um, I previously that stock photo brand was under representation matters. Uh, I have recently, uh, combined that with the rest of my photography business so that I had more time to sleep <laughs> because it turns out the running multiple brands takes a lot of time. And so that's now under my man brand at body liberation photos. You see, so you can get to that at body liberation photos.com or body liberation stock.com. Either one will take you to where you need to go. But but the whole site is primarily fat bodies, and there's there as much as representation as I can get of people of color and people with various illnesses and disabilities. And every person in there, it's just been such a cool project because every person in there, um, if it is two, you know, two women posing together as a couple, they're an actual couple in the real world. If it's somebody that I have tagged with chronic illness or depression or bipolar disorder. That's a person who actually has bipolar disorder. That's what that person looks like in the real world. If it's a person who is non-binary or transgender or like a Polynesian American, whatever, that's a person who is legit, like they're not acting. That's actually who they are in the real world. So it's this really cool way to get high quality photos of people who, you know, representatives of real world people and the funny thing is that since I've started, it's just become apparent what, like, just this yawning chasm of need um, that needs to be filled because, you know, I am one person with one camera. And so, so I was, you know, and I, I have access to certain things and I don't have access to others, but there's, there's a desperate need 
for fat people, photos of fat people in medical contexts that aren't shaming. Mm-hmm. Because we've all seen like that, <laughs> that stock photo of like the fat white woman with like a kind of a concerned hand on her stomach and then the thin white female doctor who with like a hand on her shoulder. We've all seen that photo. <laughs> But, like, we don't have any other, we don't have positive context. And so, and that is not something that I have had a chance to tackle yet is medical context. But, like, we don't have anything. So you can't, you can't see representation of fat bodies in medical context in the media because we don't, in a positive sense, because we don't even have that. It doesn't exist. And it's on my list, I guarantee you. But, <laughs> but just being able to give companies and small businesses and, and individual, you know, sole proprietors, and, you know, and there are hospital systems that are starting to use these photos and, and just giving people a way to choose to represent large bodies. That was something that literally didn't exist in the world. And at this point, and in 2020, I have, um, there's a couple of uh, competitors who have sprung up who are releasing some things for free. And I, I do release uh, some stock photos for free every month via my newsletter as well. Um, and so it is wonderful that there are both, there's some free resources out there now that are doing things similar to what I'm doing. Um, and then my work, um, most of it is not free, but that's because I need to eat. <laughs> and, and also because the people who are in the photos, I'm paying them a living wage for their time too, which is so important because these are marginalized people. Right. And nobody wants to pay them anyway. So the fact that I'm offering them a living wage for their time to come in, or they can choose to get to get photos from the session, one or the other. Uh, and some of them choose photos and some of them choose money. And, and of course, that's, that's completely up to them. But that transgender woman who is walking on the beach or whatever, like, who else is offering to pay her a living wage for her time? So, so I feel like it's sort of a cascading um, – a cascading way to support causes I believe in. And it's like I said, it's just, it's freaking magical because I get to represent large bodies. I get to do it at a living wage for my own time. I get by, by charging an appropriate amount for the photos. I get to pay marginalized people a living wage. They get a chance to get in front of the camera because most of the people that I'm working with, they, they can't afford a professional photographer. So it gives them a chance to see their own bodies in that context and, you know, in a, and again, in a positive context, and they get to help change the world, too. It's just it's, it's just it's absolutely a thrilling thing to be working on. I love that you brought this up, even the idea around paying your models and thereby charging for your service, charging for the stock photos. I think that's so important. I think anytime we are charging a price, making a profit, I know we don't always make a profit when we charge a price, but... <laughs> But either way, anytime that we're receiving money from others directly for work that is centering or using either the skill, the voice, the imagery of people in marginalized bodies, I think it is so important to pay them exactly because of why you said they're already marginalized, already in our culture, in the workforce in general. They are being compensated less for equal work, if not better work. And so it's so important to pay them for their time. And that makes me even more excited about, I thought, I thought I couldn't be more excited (laughs) about the work that you were doing, but that makes me so happy. Uh, I know that's not the only thing you do though. So we have the stock photography, but you also, I am a follower. I receive the body liberation guide. You have a body love box. I'd love for you to share about some of those things with the listeners as we're wrapping up so that they can find out ways that they can get more of your voice and more of your wisdom in front of them if they'd like it. Yeah. So the Body Liberation Guide is my weekly email newsletter and it's free. And so, so one of my, one of my superpowers is organization. Um, I'm an extremely organized person. I always have been. Uh, I'm a list maker. Uh, Asana is my organizational drug of choice, Mm asana.com. And, and, and I mean, in the work that I'm doing, I kind of have to be um, because I also do uh, writing, editing, and consulting. I have a part-time corporate job, uh, and then I have the photography, and then I have the subscription box. And so, so doing all of these different things has lent itself really well to this personality that I have that's very, very organized. And so one of the things that I have been doing for many years now is collecting resources uh, for health at every size, for body positivity, for plus size fashion, for, oh, I don't even know. And I've been involved in this work for so long that I've collected a lot of stuff. 
so the body liberation guide is my way of sharing that in sort of a usable bite-sized fashion with people. Uh, because here's my giant Evernote archive of 5,000 health at every size aligned articles. <laughs> Isn't necessarily all that helpful. But here are five haze aligned articles on intuitive eating. You know, that that's usable. That's that's awesome bite sized chunk. So every week I send out this body liberation guide and it has um it has my favorite photo of the week that I've taken um and how you can buy that as an art print. It has um it has some kind of intelligent thought from me on on body liberation in some form. Last week's was I can't write if I don't have pants. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> <laughs> which had my highest open rate of any email ever because people were wondering why on earth I wasn't wearing pants when I was writing. And um, and the the answer was that it, what we talked about earlier with the access, like if I don't have access to basic things like pants I can wear, I can't change the world because I'm too busy looking for pants I can wear. But but so so every every week we've got some kind of there's some kind of writing from me on body liberation and then there's a whole bunch of little chunks of bite sized resources and that has been really fun to produce because like I said it, it sort of fulfills my organizational <laughs> tick and it also has been really 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 helpful to the people who get it um, and so you can get that on my site at bodyliberationphotos.com there's a place to sign up for that and then I also have the body love box which is the monthly subscription box. Is at thebodylovebox.com, and it's, it's it's a whole separate thing. The Body Love Box again is one of these amazing cascading ways to support lots of different people uh, and support, in this case, support marginalized artists, because the box goes out every month and it has uh, it always has a body liberation journal, which is something I create, and that's a journaling exercise every month that comes to you in paper form, so you can write on it. It has some kind of artwork from from one or more different marginalized artists. And every box, again, it pays a living wage to me, and it pays a living wage to these artists. So the way that most subscription boxes work is they are based on free stuff. And I don't mean free stuff to you, the consumer. I mean things that the company gets for free or highly discounted. Because what mainstream subscription boxes do is they go to small businesses and they say, hey, if you give me 300 I don't know, sugar scrubs to put in the box for August, then you're going to get all this exposure. And so we want you to do this for free or for heavily discounted. And businesses do because, you know, exposure is good. It doesn't pay the bills, but it's good. And honestly, I don't know what the return on investment is like for those businesses. I have no idea. But when I started the body, the body love box, I said, nope, we're not going to work that way. We're going to pay artists living wage. And that has been, it's actually been really challenging, again, as a small business owner, because what that means is that the box costs $38 a month plus shipping, and you're getting five to seven items plus the Body Liberation Journal. And then some, there's always some small stuff that goes in the box, too. But it means that you're not getting, for 40 bucks, you're not getting a huge box filled with factory-made stuff. You're getting artisan, handmade goods. And so the perceived value may not be as high. And so that is something where I have to do a lot of customer education. Like, this is what happens. This is what it looks like when we pay people a living wage. This is what it looks like when we pay people for their work in an amount they can live on. So on my end, it means I don't haggle. When business owners tell me what their wholesale rate is, if I can afford to put it in the box, it goes in the box. If I can, it doesn't. I don't ever come back to them and say, can you cut that wholesale rate in half? I know you're going to take a loss, but it'll get you a lot of exposure. I don't do that. And so, uh, so everything, everything that goes in is at this living wage. And it means that everything that goes in is actually supporting marginalized people as opposed to, you know, well, you'll get some publicity out of it. (laughs) And so, and so this is another thing that I'm so proud of because once again, it's this cascading way to help people. And it's a really fantastic way for allies people who are in various types of privileged bodies, particularly folks who are in thin bodies, to not only learn more about the experience of living in a fat body, because uh, I put a lot of zines in, because they're the perfect size to fit physically, and they're one of the most honest and raw ways to look at the experience of living in a fat body. Um, There's one that I send out uh, one I sent out in the very first Body Love box. It's now in the shop where you can buy a single issue. It's called Fat is Beautiful. 
and it's a whole zine. If you haven't, if you don't haven't encountered zines before, they're um, they're small books that people put together by hand, and like on usually in like a photocopier, and they're very they're sort of scrappy and raw and real. And there's a whole zine on fat is beautiful, and like where else are you gonna find that? And so, so it's this really great way for, particularly for allies who, again, do, you know, statistically tend to get paid more and have more privilege and to not know what it's like to live in this oppressed body. It's this really great way both to learn and to support. And so I have a lot of um, people in thin bodies who do subscribe, partly so that they can support less privileged people and partly because they're there to learn. Oh, that's great. Uh, one more thing that I would love you to tell everybody, all the listeners, is where they can find you in general, website, Facebook, Instagram, where can they get more of Lindley in their life? So Central Lindley is always at bodyliberationphotos.com. And I'm sure that will be in the show notes too. Yes. And and that will take you to everything. That takes you to the body liberation guide. That will take you to the stock photos. There's a link, a link in, the, in the navigation to take you to the body love box too. Um, but if you want to go straight to the body love box, it's at thebodylovebox.com. The Body Love Box does have its own uh, social media channels, too. So it's always at The Body Love Box, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, if you want to find me, I am at Body Liberation with Lindley on Instagram. On Facebook, I'm at Body Liberation with Lindley Ashline. And on Twitter, I'm at Lindley Ashline. And again, all these things are, are on the website because they are many and varied. And, uh, and so that's always your central bodyliberationphotos.com is always your central location. Perfect. And listeners, you can find all of these links in the show notes as well. We'll put them right in there. Lindley, it is time for us to go. But before we do, can you just, if you had one thing, if you had one thing to share with the listeners when it comes to body liberation, if there's one thing you want to make sure they either learned from this conversation or something you haven't yet had an opportunity to share, what would you want to tell them? Oh, wow. Wow. I think the thing that I would most want to share is just be aware of other people as you move through your day, both in the, the sense that we've talked about, like look at other people's bodies because it will help you normalize your own body within the context of the wonderful natural range of human variations. Um, but just be aware of other people um, in the sense that if you're in a waiting room and you happen to have sat on the bench like the one bench in the waiting room because because you have a person, it was nice to be able to put it down beside you. And you notice a, a, another person walk in. Are they bigger than you? Maybe they need that bench. Maybe that's the only chair they can sit in, in that waiting room. So it might be nice to just sort of casually get up and move to a chair with arms so that the person who can't fit in that chair has a place to sit. Um, you know, maybe if you are, if you're in line for a public restroom and a fat person is coming out of the restroom, maybe scooch over so that they can get by you. Um, just be aware of other people. You know, when you pull into a parking lot, maybe don't park right on top of the car next to you. <laughs> um, because you are actively, like, that's an act of activism. I know it sounds really silly and, and minor, but it's not. It's not petty at all. Because just being aware of other bodies in the same space as you, you're actively making other people's lives better. And so that is, like, the easiest act of fat activism that you can start with right there. Thank you for that advice. And thank you so much for being a guest on Real Health Radio. It was wonderful to chat with you, Lindley, and I hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, before I say goodbye, I want to leave you with a personal recommendation or four, as we've been doing at the end of every episode. This month, what I really want to do is continue the momentum I'm hopeful you've gained in understanding white supremacy and engaging in anti-racism work as a result of our global civil rights movement to seek justice and equity for black lives here in America and everywhere. I'm assuming and oh so hopeful that you've already begun doing the difficult and life-changing work of dismantling your own racism. If not prior to the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many like them, then surely since then. So I thought I'd encourage you to keep going and keep learning with some helpful podcast resources direct from my personal podcast listening list to you. The first podcast I'll recommend is White Homework, which is a conversational podcast designed to teach white people in particular about racial disparities and restorative justice in America. 
Another great one is Seeing White. It's an oldie, but a goodie. Produced by Seen on Radio, this series discusses the origins of race and thereby whiteness. It helps a listener to understand white supremacy and begin the work of dismantling it in our own lives and our communities. 1619, which launched last year, gives an honest account of America's history through a storytelling approach that begins with the arrival of slave ships on U.S. shores in, you guessed it, 1619. And finally, Code Switch is a weekly NPR show hosted by journalists of color who share their thoughts on race in America through pop culture, history, politics, and more. And there you have it, four wonderful podcasts to continue your anti-racism learning and living. Hopefully one, if not all of them, resonates with you. Happy listening, my friends, and thank you for joining me and Lindley today. We'll be back next week with another great episode of Real Health Radio. Until then, you can find us at 7-health.com, and the show notes for this specific episode can be found at 7-health.com forward slash 202. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, 7-health is here for you and continuing to take on clients, so if you're interested in working together to heal your relationship with food, body, and self, or if you simply want to find out more, head over to 7-health.com forward slash help. H-E-L-P, and apply for a free initial chat with us there.